and Jacob Barnett. Are you guys excited? Yeah. All righty. I'm here to tell you why you guys should forget everything you know right now. So <laughs> first thing you guys need to know. So suppose you guys are all doing your homework. OK, you know, it's something you have to do. And you're doing great on your homework. You're getting great grades. And you're getting fabulous prizes, such as, you know, Benjamins and all this great stuff. I'm here to tell you you're doing it all wrong. That's right. I did just say that. You're doing it all wrong. In order to succeed, you have to look at everything with your own unique perspective. OK, what does that mean? That means that when you think, you must think in your own creative way, not accepting everything that's already out there. By the way, the people I'm showing in the background are my little brothers, Ethan and Wesley. One of them's a chemist, and the other one's a meteorologist. <laughs> so your perspective might be the only way you can see art or history or music or whatever. So let me show you one of the ways in which I can see math. So for example, that's 32, and the rotations represent um, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, et cetera. So today, I, my main reason of coming out here is to do some quantum mechanics, OK? So today, what we're going to do is we're going to do the Schrodinger equation, split it into a time dependent and a time independent component, and we're going to solve it for the boundary conditions of a lattice and a particle in a box. So <laughs> let's get to work. So I have some lecture notes, which I'd like you guys to pass out. I'm going to split them into two rows. So if I can have some people come up and get these. No, wait. Before you come up here, I need to let you know about something very quickly. OK, just stay there. I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I did not come here to frighten you all with quantum mechanics. Not yet. <laughs> So let's think about something simpler. How many of you here have heard about circles? <laughs> OK, good. So why are circles important? They're the shape of cookies. <laughs> they're the shape of skateboard wheels. And most importantly, they're the shape of the thing that turns on your Xbox 360. <laughs> so what do we know from school about circles? We know pi r squared. We know they're round. Do we know anything else? Not really. <laughs> so let me show you something cool you can do with circles. It's called Johnson's theorem, where really a theorem is just you know, a way mathematicians can think of stuff. So what Johnson said was you take three circles, you overlap them in a way such that there are six blue lines, where I, I call each of the circles blue, such that there are six lines coming in one point. The other three points are on a circle of the same size. Interesting. So this isn't just pi r squared. This is something new. So because Johnson didn't just think, oh, it's got to be pi r squared and round, that's it, he created math. And he did it in his own unique perspective way. So now, I know not all of you are necessarily mathematically gifted, so. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to some more interesting stuff. By now, you might have heard about Isaac Newton in, in your high school careers. You might have heard about him from you know, prisms or whatever he might have done. So in 1665, Isaac Newton was at the University of Cambridge. Now, for those of you who really know your history, at that time, Cambridge had closed due to the plague. So Isaac Newton, he didn't have a way to learn. He had to stop learning. And he was probably you know, hiding in a dormitory with his cat running from the plague. Now, while he was doing this, he decided he had to stop learning, but he didn't want to stop thinking. OK? So because of that, he was thinking about this problem in astrophysics. And specifically, I think he wanted to calculate the motion of the moon around the Earth. So I sort of reamped re that problem into the case of Mercury around the sun. So OK. What he did was, in order to solve this problem, he created calculus, Newton's three laws, the universal law of gravitation, the reflecting telescope to check his work, and optics, and all this crazy stuff. In that two years that he had stopped learning. <laughs> so I guess that was really good for us, because at that time, Newton had to stop learning. But when he stopped learning, he started thinking, and he created science. And he, OK, that's just, that's just great. We, we now have a theory of physics. <laughs> So, OK, he could have probably been some top scholar. He could have had a 4.0 GPA. He could have been on the dean's list. He could have had his professors proud. But he wouldn't have created anything 
if he didn't stop learning. Newton needed to start thinking and think of things with his own unique perspective in order to, you know, create his theory. So now let me formally introduce myself because I did not do that at the beginning of the talk. So about 11 years ago, I was diagnosed with this thing called autism. What that meant was I was focusing in things in such extreme detail that <laughs> it seemed like I wasn't thinking at all. Basically, I'd be like, oh, look, here's this reflection of that light, so there's a light up here. But oh, there's my shadow, so there's a light back there. And I look over, and it's over there. OK. <laughs> OK. So because of that, you know, people thought I would never learn because it, it just looked like I was just staring into the open. It looked like I wasn't doing anything at all. So people told me I would never learn, I'd never think, I'd never talk, I'd never tie my shoes, which, OK, they might have had a point on. You know, I'm wearing sandals. <laughs> so <laughs> you know. But however, at that age, I went to the Barnes and Noble, and I got a textbook. And from the data that was in the textbook, I derived Kepler's laws. When I wasn't supposed to be learning or thinking at all. So basically, from the other people's point of view, it was just, you know, it wasn't really looking too good. I wasn't finger painting or doing story time or any of the other stuff the two, three, four-year-olds would do. But, you know, what they, ha what they did was because of that, they took me to special ed, which is extremely special, and the fact it didn't educate me. <laughs> so during that time, I, was, I had to stop learning because I, I didn't have a way to learn. You know, I was just in special ed. So what they would do is, you know, OK. So I wasn't able to learn anything at all. However, at that age, I started thinking about things in sort of the way of, oh, all these shadows. And I think that's why I like astrophysics and physics and math today. Because I had to stop learning. I believe that's why I do what I do today. OK, so let me continue about gravity. OK? So you know, it's a very exciting topic for those of us who are in physics. So let me continue. <laughs> now, what happened was, about a couple of centuries later, the physicists had enough experimental technology to test Newton's orbit. Now, Newton predicted that the orbit of Mercury was an oval, or as scientists like to say, an ellipse. However, when we pointed our telescopes out, we saw that thing. So, OK, for those of you who are scientists, you know that's extremely exaggerated. But OK, this was not looking good. Newton had failed. One of the greatest physicists of all minds had failed. He failed. <laughs> <laughs> so we need someone else, well, just like Newton had done, to forget everything they knew and you know, recreate this. That man's name was Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, what he would do, he was also, you know, he was stopped in his tracks. He was not doing very well. He was, he was Jewish, and it was pre-Nazi Germany, so he was not able to get a position at the local university. He had to work at a patent office, which, OK, that's not theoretical physics. And we're talking about Einstein here. So <laughs> yeah, what happened was Einstein, he had all this time to think all of a sudden. He had to stop learning. But he had all this time to think. And so what he had done was he liked to have these thought experiments. And he liked to think about all these different things. So what Einstein thought of was, OK, he pictured himself on a trampoline with a couple of friends, which, OK, there's actually a failure of my sentence there and the fact that physicists, that's usually a couple more than they have. <laughs> <laughs> so. Isaac Newton was probably on a, tra oh, I'm sorry, Albert Einstein was probably on the trampoline with one of his friends. And, you know, they were probably playing some, I don't know, tennis or something. <laughs> so, however, you know, they're physicists. They don't have very good hand eye coordination. So they probably didn't, you know, catch the tennis ball and it went rolling around them. And Einstein looked at this and he said, without friction, this is gravity. <laughs> he realized this is just gravity. So afterwards, he predicted the motion, which is going to end up like that crazy thing. But that crazy thing is exactly that other crazy thing. So Einstein had solved the problem just by thinking about it in his own unique perspective, in his own unique way. He stopped learning, and he started thinking, and he started creating. So now let me get back on the story. You, you know, I wasn't really looking too good. So I, kinda, I, did, I just kind of brushed it over there. <laughs> so 
about three years ago, I, okay, there is a calculus class I wanted to sit in the back of, so I decided in order to sit in the back of this, I am going to learn algebra, trigonometry, all the other middle school stuff, all the high school math, and first year undergrad calculus in two weeks, so I can sit in the back of this class. I was 10. <laughs> okay. So also at that time, for this, I got accepted into the university. And yet again, I was still 10. So, okay. Then I had to go to an entrance interview, okay? You know, that's what you got to do. It's, it's the university. So I had to go to this entrance interview, and because of parking, I had all these coins, and, you know, I dropped them all over the guy's office, making him think I had no common sense, and I, he pretty much held me back for a semester. So I also had to stop learning at that time. Okay, what did I do? Did I stop learning and just, you know, start playing video games and stuff? No! <laughs> I started thinking about shapes. <laughs> and I was thinking about the specific problem in astrophysics that I was really interested in at that time, which I, I still kind of am. Now, what I did was, over the next two weeks, I started thinking about these shapes, I started thinking about this problem, and after a while, I had solved it. So I had solved this problem in astrophysics, which basically it's similar to, you know, what's happening with Einstein and Newton right now. I'm not going to tell you the exact problem due to the fact that I have not published it yet. When my paper gets published, you may figure out about it. <laughs> For those of you who read scientific papers. <laughs> okay, so I thought about all these problems. It, and, you know, I only had a 500 sheet thing of paper from Ofsmax. And since I was thinking of all these multidimensional things, it filled them up really quickly. So then I moved on to whiteboards, because I was out of paper. But the whiteboard, it also filled up pretty quickly, you know. So then I moved on to my parents' windows. <laughs> After that, I just got to get chased down by all this Windex and stuff. And, you know, my equations would get erased by these horrible Windex creators. But <laughs> so because of that, after about a month or so, my parents realized I wasn't going out to the park and I was just drawing these weird shapes on the windows. And basically, I was trying to disprove myself. You know, I didn't want to act like Newton. I did not want to, you know, be proven 100 years down the road, disproved. So what I did was I was going on the windows. I was trying to disprove myself, but to no avail. After that, my parents, you know, they figured I should be on the park. So they called some guy up at Princeton, and they told him to disprove what I was doing. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case, and he said I was on the right track. So not going to the park. <laughs> okay, so then because I had to stop learning, I started thinking and I solved the problem. After that, I oh whoops. After that, I decided to create a calculus video for other people who wanted to still do calculus, the, the three others out there, and <laughs> so that way they could also learn. Okay. So I made this calculus video. People noticed that I was 12 and I was doing a calculus video. After that, the first people that noticed was the Indianapolis Star. And they put me on the front page of some newspaper. And as you can see from this picture, I was eating a sandwich. <laughs> it was really yummy. So OK. After that, my calculus video, it went viral. It, as a type of this photo, it had some 2 million views. So first of all, a calculus video going viral. Who would have ever thought? <laughs> so after that, it got translated into whatever this language is. Is there anybody who can tell me what language this is? I, I can't read it. OK, it's Chinese. OK, good to know. <laughs> so then after that, I had some guy from Fox TV called me up. And I was able to draw on his windows, and he was Glenn Beck. <laughs> the thing special about that experience is that the windows were huge, 23 floors above the ground, and overlooked the Chrysler building. So that was a fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> then after that, I started having some really strange visitors show up to my house. <laughs> <laughs> I had Morley Safer show up, and he's from CBS 60 Minutes. Now, 
For those of you who can really see this picture very well, you may notice that I'm wearing the same sandals. <laughs> so, OK. Now, let us sort of recap what we've done. Have Einstein and Johnson and Newton and everyone I talked about, are they really geniuses? Is that really what makes them so special? Is that really why they did all their work? Absolutely not. They, no, that's not why. OK, so what happened was all they did was they made the transition from learning to thinking to creating, which by now the media is translated into you know, genius. Now, I'm pretty sure they have relatively high IQs, but as some of you may know, there are lots of people out there with high IQs who don't create this sort of thing. They usually just end up memorizing a couple hundred thousand digits of pi. So first of all, my question to them is, why not memorize a different number? Like, I mean, I'm wearing phi right now, so OK. <laughs> so in conclusion, I'm not supposed to be here at all. You know, I was told that I wouldn't talk. There's probably some therapist watching this who's freaking out right now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm not supposed to be talking. I'm not supposed to be learning. But because I made that transition from learning to thinking to creating, I am here today. And I'm talking to some 400 to 800 people in New York. OK, now what do I want you guys to get out of this speech? OK, what I want you guys to do is for the next 24 hours, I know you guys may have school or whatnot, even though it's a Saturday. For the next, tw <laughs> for the next 24 hours, don't learn anything. You are not allowed to learn anything for the next 24 hours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> However, what I'd like you to do is I'd like to, you to go into some field. I mean, you all have some passion. I don't know about it. I've been talking to you for 11 minutes. I, I have no idea what you guys are interested in. But you guys have some passion all out there, and you all know what it is. So I want you to think about that field instead of learning that field. And instead of being a student of that field, be the field, whether it's music or architecture or science or whatever. And I want you to think about that field. And who knows, maybe you can create something. Thank you very much. I'm Jacob Barnett. <laughs> <laughs>